Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God, and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our defense and that we shall not be moved. We also thank you that you are the ruler of all time. You are the one who reigns forever. And you are a friend of ours. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for loving the world. We thank you for the record that we have in your word of, of what you have revealed to us about yourself. We thank you for all of it. We pray, Heavenly Father, that in fact we might keep learning and growing in your word. Show us today what you want us to see in your word. And we pray, Father, for you, know, you to touch our hearts, our minds, our lives, our spirits, our souls, our bodies. Just touch us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Renew us and restore us and enliven us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, got a lot to do today. Like I said, don't worry. Be happy. You know, Acts chapter 25 and 26, they are really the account of Paul before Festus and Paul before King Agrippa and his wife Bernice. And a lot of this we have heard before. And so it's kind of like we're taking it in chunks, okay? Uh, so that's why we can do two chapters at once. When you take it in chunks, when you've heard a lot of it before, you can do that sort of thing. But chapter 25 starts out, Festus then, having arrived in the province, three days later went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. Now between chapter you know, 25 and 24, there's a two-year span that Paul was in prison in Caesarea. That's where Felix left him. <laughs> when you don't know what to do with the prisoner, you just leave him there. Okay. Thankfully, though, there was some freedom so his friends could come and minister to him. So he, people had access to him. So now we have Festus, and Festus has replaced Felix as governor of the area. But two years have passed, and guess what? The chief priest and the leading men of the Jews are still after Paul. They haven't given up. They're kind of like a dog going after a bone. Man, they keep digging and digging and digging. And what did they want this time? They requested a concession against Paul that they might have him brought to Jerusalem. That's what they were asking for. But in parentheses, we know exactly what's going on. At the same time, they were setting an ambush to kill him on the way. That was their plan. So nothing had changed except two years had passed. Festus then answered that Paul was being kept in custody in Caesarea and that he himself was about to leave shortly. And he says, therefore, let the influential men among you go there with me and if there's anything wrong about the man, let them prosecute him. At verse 6, after he had spent not more than eight or ten days among them, he went down to Caesarea. On the next day, he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. After Paul arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him, which they could not prove. Isn't that interesting? They stood around him. Can you imagine Paul right here and all these guys that are accusing him just kind of whoop. That's like, that doesn't sound very safe. <laughs> Except that they were in Caesarea and the you know, head guy was there, so nothing was going to happen. But they were bringing many and serious charges against him, which they could not prove. While Paul said in his own defense, I have committed no offense either against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. And he had not. But verse 9 says, But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? Why would he want to do the Jews a favor? This is why. Jerusalem, Judea, 
the province of the Jews tended to be a hotbed of uprisings. The Jews did not like Roman occupation. Festus is new to the area. And so what he's trying to do is quell any future uprisings by doing them a favor. Okay? That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to get in like Flynn with the, with the leading men of the people so that nothing will go wrong in the, in the, you know, in the future. That's what he's trying to do. That's why he's trying to um, do them a favor. But the procurator, which Festus was, or the governor of the area, he actually held the power of jurisdiction with regard to capital punishment. So it was really in his purview, his right, to carry out this trial. Okay. But Paul said, you know, Paul, the Roman citizen, knows his rights. And he says, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of these things is true, of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Well, that was his right. A Roman citizen had the privilege of transferring their trial from the provincial governor to the emperor. And so Paul, the Roman citizen, as was his right, took it. He appealed to Caesar. Now Paul knew that he was going to be going to Rome anyway. I mean, that's what Jesus has, told, has already told him. Jesus already at night has says, you know, as you have testified and witnessed to me here in Jerusalem, so you also will testify about me in Rome. And so he appeals to Caesar, and probably thinking that's a fast way to get to Rome. And guess what? It won't be in my pocketbook because the government's going to pay for it. So it's like, I'm going to be their prisoner. They're, they're going to have to get me there. So I don't, it doesn't come out of my pocket. So that's a good plan. Festus, then when Festus had conferred with his council, he answered, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. It's interesting then is verse 13. Now when several days had elapsed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus, the new governor. So the king comes down and pays his respects to the new governor. Now, who is this King Agrippa? Well, you wouldn't know it by just looking at his name. But he is actually the great-grandson of Herod the Great. He's actually the great-grandson of the guy who wanted all the babies in Jerusalem in that area killed. That's who Agrippa is. The great-grandson of Herod. The one to whom the wise men came looking for the new king of the Jews. That's who King Agrippa is. So, King Agrippa and, and Bernice have come to Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus, and while they were spending many days there, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there is a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix, and when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I mean... You know, they were just going to go for the jugular. It didn't matter if they assassinated him on the way. They didn't want Paul alive. Well, this was Festus's answer to those people at that time. He said, I answered them that it is not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accused meets his accusers face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. So thankfully, there's some fairness going on there. And Festus is gonna, going to be fair in this situation. So, after they had assembled here, I did not delay, but on the next day took my seat at the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought before me. When the accuser stood up, 
they began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting. He's thinking crimes, okay? But this is what he learned. But they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion, about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. That's what it was about. And Festus knew it. It's like, man, this isn't worthy of condemnation. This is a doctrinal dispute. Verse 20, being at a loss how to investigate such a matter, or such matters, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there stand trial on these matters, but when Paul appealed to be held in custody for the emperor's decision, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I send him to Caesar. Festus is at a loss. So, then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So on the deck, next day when Agrippa came together with Bernice amid great pomp and entered the auditorium accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa, and all you gentlemen here present with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appeal to me both at Jerusalem and here, loudly declaring that he ought not live any longer. But I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death. And since he himself appealed to, emperor, to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet I have nothing definite about him to write to my lord. Therefore I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner not to indicate also the charges against him. That makes sense. I mean, you're going to send the prisoner no charges. The emperor may just as well send for you. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? You know, you, you know, forget it. You're not worthy of the office you are now holding. And uh, in fact, you're more worthy of discipline yourself. So he's thinking, I've got to have something to write about this guy. Chapter 26. Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all these things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions about the Jews, or among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion, and now I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made to our fathers, the promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O king, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? He kind of just throws that one out there. I mean, he's on trial because of hope. Isn't that terrible? That, that, that because you have hope, you can get in trouble. I mean, does, do they just simply want everybody to be miserable? He's on trial because he has hope. Come on. And of course, the Jews in Jerusalem knew all about Paul. But as he said, if they're willing to tell you. Now he goes into what we've heard before. So then I thought to myself that I had to do many hostile things to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. You know, it, it, there's, there just seems to be kind of a, a strange segue between verse 8 and verse 9. That, you know, suddenly he's going back to what he did before his encounter with the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. 
He says, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. To the name of Jesus, okay? To discredit it in some way. So that they, he would not have any kind of followers. He's going to discredit this name as, as much as he can. And this is just what I did. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme and be furiously enraged at them. I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. Listen to that. He tried to force them to blaspheme. That's happening today. That's what ISIS is trying to do to the Christians. While so engaged, while I was doing this, as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priest at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He wasn't just going after a name. He was going after a person. And as he was going against the people who claim Jesus as Savior and Lord, he's going after Jesus. That's how Jesus looks at it. Those who go after his people go after him. But the Lord said to him, Get up. Stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God that they may, for, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. That is a tremendously powerful verse. Why was he being sent? He's being sent with the message so that the eyes of all, Gentile and Jew, could turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God. Notice there is no neutral ground. It's either the dominion of Satan or God's dominion. The kingdom of Satan or God's kingdom. That's all there is. I mean, a lot of people think they can, that there's this great big neutral zone. And that they don't have to make a decision. Well, not making a decision is a decision against Christ. Turning from darkness to light so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. What does faith bring us? Sanctification. What does the word sanctification mean? It means being made holy. Sanctified means being made holy. That's the Holy Spirit's job, is to make us to be like Christ, who had no sin. Verse 19, So King Agrippa, I, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first, and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Isn't that interesting? Performing deeds appropriate to repentance. In other words, he's saying your life needs to reflect this change of heart you say you have. None of this, I claim Christ, but I'm going to keep on living the way I want to live. None of that. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. For the reason that he is preaching repentance and Jesus. That's why they're trying to seize me and put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. 
We're going to get back to that sentence. That the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Testifying to both small and great. Right now he's standing before King Agrippa. Before that it was Festus the governor. Before that it was Felix. Before that it was the council in Jerusalem. And Lysias. Claudius Lysias. You know, wherever he is going, he is proclaiming Jesus Christ and him crucified and raised from the dead. While Paul was saying this, that he was testifying of Christ and his resurrection from the dead, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a a corner. In other words, Paul wasn't in the dark, in a corner, whispering these things. No! He was out in in public. I mean, sometimes he had private meetings, but he was out in the public. Nothing was done in secret. Verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Now, King Agrippa is not Jewish. He's Roman. He's Roman. He's not Jewish. He's Roman. So he, you know, but, you know, they've had plenty of dealings with the Jews over the course of many years since Herod the Great. Uh, And so, uh, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian? And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I, except for these chains. The king stood up, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them, and when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is doing nothing worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. I guess not. Besides, he wants to go to Rome. But as I was thinking about this and how how Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets, I got to thinking about the probability of him doing that. The probability of Jesus fulfilling prophecy. And that's where I want to go now. The probability of him fulfilling the law of Moses and the prophets. And I found an article. I didn't hand it out to you yet. It'll be in the back because y'all have been all reading it and not paying any attention. This is like, you know. <laughs> I mean, y'all are looking at me like these little, what us? So, I mean, first of all, you've got to know what the probability is. What is probability? Probability, it's known as the odds. It's a branch of mathematics. And, uh, and it's like trying to figure out the odds of something happening. Like, uh, the odds of being struck by lightning in a year is 1 in 700,000. The odds of being killed by lightning in a year is 1 in 2 million. Uh, the odds of becoming president of the United States, one in ten million. <laughs> the odds of a meteorite landing on your house is one in, let's see, one in 180 trillion. It's kind of getting up there. The odds that you will eventually die, one in one. <laughs> Shucks. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but this fellow, Dr. Stoner, <laughs> after the meteor, after the meteorite, Dr. Stoner is talking. 
so he's, he's, you know, he's an applied mathematician. So he decided he was going to look into the chances of Jesus fulfilling eight, just eight of 300 prophecies about Jesus concerning Jesus in the Bible. Now, there are more than 300 of them. But he thought, what's the probability of him fulfilling eight of them? Just eight out of 300. Uh, so he went, you know, looking at that. And this is what he came up with. The probability of Christ being born in Bethlehem was one in 280,000. The probability that John would be the forerunner of Christ was uh, one in a thousand. That's kind of low. The probability of Christ entering into Jerusalem riding on a donkey was one in a hundred. The probability that Christ would be betrayed by a friend is one in a thousand. The probability that Christ would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver was one in a thousand. The probability that 30 pieces of silver would be cast down and then used to buy the potter's field was one in 100,000. The probability that although innocent, Christ would, be, would remain silent at his trial was one in a thousand. The probability that Christ would be crucified was one in 10,000. Well, those all seem kind of to be low probabilities. Pretty low. Ah, but the probability of all eight of them happening is you add up all of the probabilities. You know, you add up 10 to the 5, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, whatever. You add up all those little 3, 4, 5s, whatever. And so, therefore, all of those particular eight probabilities together would come up to 1 to the 28th power. That's kind of like 1 to a trillion trillion. One to a trillion trillion that he would do all eight of them. And yet, we know that he did. In fact, of the 300 prophecies, we were just looking at eight of these, and I found a YouTube video which was really kind of cool. Turns out that in one day, he fulfilled 29. In one day, he fulfilled 29 of the 300. And they listed them, scrolled them. I'm like, going, wow. So, the probability... Oh, here's another way to look at it. <laughs> here's another way to look at it. Is if you got all of the Girl Scout cookies, the Thin Mints, and scattered them all over the state of Texas. Okay? Scattered them all over the state of Texas. Uh, you know edge to edge, you know, all over. You, ended up with, you would end up with a pile that's probably about five feet tall. Okay? But then you would take one, you know, gold one, golden thin mint, toss it somewhere in the middle, and then send a person blindfold into Texas and say, go through all these thin mints, blindfolded, and then pick out the one that's gold. The probability is not so good. <laughs> and yet, Jesus fulfilled not eight, not 29, but all of these. In fact, I read another uh, statistic which I thought was pretty stunning in that they're saying that as far as electrons go in the universe, there are like 10 to the 79th power. So 10 with 79 zeros behind it, that's how many electrons they think are in the universe. Okay? But the fact that he would fulfill all of these particular prophecies is 1 times 10 to the 147th power. So far, far more than there are electrons in the universe. In other words, our God is pretty amazing. And 
And that's just, I mean, that's just kind of interesting information when you're looking at all these things. You're going, you know, when you're talking to people about Jesus Christ concerning him and concerning our faith, we can say without a doubt, look what he did. Look at what he fulfilled. These are historical facts. Here's the Old Testament. Here's the fulfillment. I mean, and some of the times that we have this information in the, in the, um, in the scriptures, you know, Luke chapter 2, uh, when Quirinius was governor of Syria, he had a you know, census being taken. Or King Agrippa, or, King Fe, or, or Festus the governor, or Felix the governor. All these things are listed as they are so that we can have points in time to go back and prove what the scriptures say is true. So that the world can't say, Jesus is not a historical pe person. Excuse me. Yes, he is. And yes, he did fulfill all these prophecies. And there's still some that are still to be fulfilled. And of course, as he has fulfilled them perfectly thus far, certainly he will fulfill them perfectly in the future. So our God has a really good track record going. And it's one that we can point to when people ask us about this Jesus we believe in. Paul was saying, I am only proclaiming what the 12 tribes of Israel have been hoping for forever. That's all I'm doing. I am saying, he came. He came. He did exactly what Moses and the prophets said he would do. So is that such a big thing for me to be doing that? You've been waiting all this time. He's come, people. He's come. And of course we know he's coming again. He will fulfill everything that is said about him. Even if it is one to the 147th power. It is going to happen. With certainty it is going to happen. Amen.